Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Why don't we get started? Um, I'm Sujay King Liu, uh, Dean of the College of Engineering here at UC Berkeley. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I want to welcome you all to today's View from the Top event. Um, you might already know that this event is designed to bring leaders in business and innovative thinkers to, to our community so that we can engage with them in you know, mutually uh, enlightening conversation. And today's speaker is uh, somebody who is really amazing and I think that you'll enjoy uh, our conversation and, and I hope that it will spark a lot of good questions from the audience later on. Before going on, I'd like to acknowledge that today's event is actually co-hosted by the Society for Women Engineers and I just want to acknowledge them uh, for supporting this event. Also, like to welcome all of the members of the Dean's Society and everybody who's on, with us today watching online. Um, so as a preface to today's presentation, uh, which the, the topic is uh, about breaking boundaries, just want to mention that you know, in engineering, we are all about breaking boundaries to be able to innovate the best solutions to solve the world's most challenging problems. And I think one of the things that engineering students will need to learn more and more is to engage with people in other disciplines um, so that we can become truly well-informed and socially engaged in, in innovating solutions that will impact the world, hopefully for the benefit of humanity. So it's really my pleasure today to welcome uh, Ms. Chandrika Tandon. She's a business leader, she's a Grammy Award nominated artist, and she's also a humanitarian. So she spans pretty much the widest range of experiences that I think uh, we can imagine. So I'd like to just highlight a few key um, aspects of her biography. Um, she is a business leader, um, and uh, in that respect, she's a former partner at McKinsey and & Company, and she now chairs her own advisory firm called Tandon Capital Associates. Um, she's actually vice chairman of the Board of Trustees of New York University, NYU, and I'm really pleased to have the former president of NYU, uh, Dr. Sexton, here with us today in the audience. Um, so she's done a lot of things at NYU, and she just, for the sake of time, she just said, just say that she's done a lot for NYU. <laughs> okay. But um, she's also a mu musician, and she has actually performed at the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts, in, um, and she's actually going to perform there again in a couple of months, and she actually serves on the, as a member of the board for the Lincoln Center nowadays. Now she's done amazing things, uh, many accomplishments for which she has won many awards. And just a couple of highlights, she won the uh, Gallatin Medal, which is NYU's highest honor for outstanding contributions to society. She's also, um, at the end here, she's also been featured on TV, CNBC's uh, The Brave Ones. So uh, maybe during our conversation, um, she can talk about some of her other awards as well. Now, when she was at the pinnacle of her business career, she became interestingly, uh, increasingly focused on life's bigger questions. And um, that's when she decided to reconnect uh, with her love of music. So she's been trained by masters in all different types of traditions, Hindu, Hindustanic, Carnatic, and Western traditions. And she has actually released four albums as a musician. And her Soul Call um, album topped the world music charts. And that's what earned her a Grammy award nomination. So at this point, I'd just like to ask you to help me to join, join me in welcoming Ms. Tandon to the stage. So today we're just going to have um, a, f uh, a flower side chat. <laughs> I'll start with some questions just to get the conversation going. Um, what I'll do is I'll um, ask Chandrika some questions just to introduce her to you all um, about her early life and background, how about her experience in corporate America, and then moving on to how she became a leader um, and how she then transitioned to also to arts, and finally um, being involved in education, um, supporting a lot of um, worthy initiatives in, in education. So that's kind of the um, roadmap for my discussion with her, and then hopefully this will spark a lot of good questions from the audience uh, in a little while. All right, so Chandrika, your story, your life story is truly remarkable. Maybe could you sort of give our audience um, a, a summary of your, how you started out as a child in India and then ended up you know, going to 
to the Indian Institute of Management and actually ended up working in New York City. You know, my tale is uh, a bit like different immigrant tales that, uh, that had sort of interesting, complex, now when you look back at it, it sounds almost uh, in, incomprehensible. My earliest memories are of my mother building a trousseau to get me married. She would exchange all her clothes to get spoons and forks, and f not forks really, but spoons and vessels so that I, and I was the oldest child in a very simple family. And literally, my path was charted out as I was born. That I was going to be married at 17, or engaged at 17, married off at 18, to an, in an honorable way, because that was what I, I had to do. And this is many years ago. This is going back about, you know, I've got, I mean, I'm going to be 65 in two days. So this is going back hmm. many, many years. And, but while this whole dynamic was going on, there was another dynamic happening, which is I had the world of books, I had the world of poetry. So I, was, I had this tradition with my grandfather of memorizing many, many, many lines of poetry. I mean, I, to this day, can recite probably about 200 poems, like very long verses. So I was dreaming of you know, Casablanca, places that I had never heard of and could never imagine. In fact, a few weeks ago, we were in Cornwall, and so, and so you know, the Pendennis, which is you know, Thackeray's famous book, History of Pendennis, which is something I read when I was 12. Mm. But you know, I was reading all these books just with my grandfather, 37 plays of Shakespeare. You know? So I read all of that. But they were all disconnected pieces. And then the third disconnected piece that was happening in my childhood is that we had a lot of chores. We came from a very simple family where the jobs you know, we didn't have people to do things for us. And so I had to get up very early in the morning, you know, take care of cleaning the house. I had a lot of jobs. I don't remember what jobs I was doing, but I can tell you what song I was singing when I was doing those chores. I was singing many songs because that's how I got through my day. And so that was sort of another, music was an integral part of what I was doing. We would listen to radio stations all the time. There were just two radio stations that played. And so whatever was going on there is something I would be reproducing in my brain and in my, with, with just singing. So that was the third sort of happening, if you like, in my childhood. And so these three big things, and then the fourth happening was that I just went on hunger strikes. I went on hunger strikes to go to college because I wanted to go to college and my mother said, over my dead body. And so basically, I said, OK, over my dead body then. You know? So you, know, <laughs> you can get pretty damn dramatic. So there I was, three days. And, you know, and I wasn't like one of these kind of hunger strike people who were secretly stealing fruits in the background, because there was nobody to give me anything. So I was just crying and howling because I wanted to go to college, and then the same thing to go to business school. So I was academically, you know, I was sort of on the top of the class. So that helped. So I had all my nun. I, I went to a Catholic convent school. And the very first time I'd seen my nun, Sister Mary Nesson, leave my Catholic convent school, leave the confines of the school, was that she left to come to my house to beg my mother to send me to college. To this, because she said, oh, even if you put her with boys, she will not go into sin, I promise you. <laughs> so this, I think, sort of helped my mother. You know, that, that's what happened. So I had all of these things happening. Now, the full import of all this hits has hit me many years later. But this was my childhood. It wasn't like somebody was saying, oh, you are meant to be great and you know, go out and conquer the world. Nobody told me anything that, like that. They said, but I wanted to break those boundaries because of the books and the reading and the poetry. That's wonderful. So clearly, you're a, a trailblazer, at least for your family. So I, um, I just wanted to mention that you have an accomplished pair of younger siblings. Right? Your younger brother, Nandu, uh, manages a, a successful hedge fund. And your sister, Indira, was the former CEO of Pepsi Corporation. So were you responsible for their success? Or did they also have no, to go on No, I wouldn't say responsible, but I will say I certainly cleared a few, m not a few, many trees, <laughs> sadly. And so I have, the, I have the blood to show for it, yes, no. No, I mean, oh, no, I, I think we all, once one person does it, it's, it gets much easier. You know, this, you're not going on a hunger strike the second time. OK. For sure. So your brother you know. and your sister did. And my brother was much younger. My brother was a little genius who was born nine years later. So he just <laughs> topped, every, he topped every chart. So, so he came on his own to Yale. 
All right. So, well, so what were the, um, the the shared lessons and values then that you think contributed to their success similarly as to your success? It's hard to say. I think all of us had very different parts because really? being the firstborn, you have you have a certain set of struggles. And I don't know how many firstborns are in this audience, Eddie. <laughs> Would you guys agree? You know, as a firstborn, you have a certain set of challenges, particularly when you come from traditional families where you are really, you're, you're trying to teach your parents a lot of things, you know, and they just <laughs> refuse to learn. What can you do? You work hard to teach them. That's, that's wonderful. And I tell my mother to this day that she should learn more, but, you know, she's 87 and, you know, she's not prepared to, what can I do? <laughs> that's wonderful. I think a lot of us can relate to that. All right, so um, let's move on to your corporate experience. You started at McKinsey at the age of 24, and at that time when you were hired, you were the first woman uh, to, to make partner, right? And the, at that time, there were also very few um, uh, partners of Indian, East Indian descent. Yeah, in yeah. fact, McKinsey was, was interesting because they had basically hired these absolute you know, world-class people from, you know, at that time, the whole firm was just 1,000 people, and now we have a thousand people in, in one office. You know, so the firm was very small. Baker Scholars from Harvard, the top, you know, one percent, if that, that came in. So I was an anomaly because I hadn't had an American education. I hadn't gone to school. So McKinsey hired me, and I came into America knowing nothing without the ramp up period of college or or school. Because when you come into Berkeley or Yale or Harvard, you know, I mean, you can make all your mistakes, but at least you're protected within the walls of a classroom. I didn't know what snow was. I didn't know how to drive a car. I didn't know you needed a winter coat. I didn't know. I mean, I had never seen snow. And then my, my part, the partner in charge of the first study, but I walked into McKinsey day one, said, oh, by the way, it's, it's a Wednesday or something. And he said, you need to show up on Monday morning in New Jersey, which is oh, it, in far away. For, as far as I'm concerned, I'd never been to New Jersey. And I'd never driven a car. So basically, I found um, a driver to teach me to drive. And I had an Indian license, which wasn't worth anything. And so I learned a lot of things about American roads. I learned that you couldn't drive. I mean, people kind of, uh, you couldn't drive on the fast lane at the slowest speed possible, <laughs> because everybody would show their finger at you. <laughs> and when people show you the finger, it doesn't mean they're wishing you well. That's the other thing I learned. I also learned that. American Roads Bank, and you engineers know this, right? American Roads are actually built for snow and water to recede, so they bank. So I stopped the car every hour to see whether I had a flat tire, because not that I would have known how to fix a flat tire, but I was certainly looking to see if I had one. So I, I did all these absolutely crazy things. So McKinsey was a huge learning experience. My clients were a huge learning experience. And this, again, is about boundaries, right? And, and this is relevant in the context of today as we talk about microaggressions and so on. I had a long career. And when I got into America, I spoke funny. I mean, I speak a little funny now, but you should have heard me then. I spoke really fast. I didn't know American mannerisms. I was working in the deep south sometimes. I was working in different parts of America. But people had never seen anyone from India. And people had never seen, so people would talk to me about red dots and cows and all of that. And not because anyone wanted to be negative. It's just that's all they knew. So it was, I had to do a lot of work mentally to rethink why people were doing this. Because it, I could have taken one view which said, oh, you know, that, that's not a good way to talk to me or whatever. But it took me a little while to understand that they were trying to find a common basis of connection with me. And that started to, some of my lifelong friends now, going back to 1979, are some of the people who taught me what lower your, your years mean. By the way, does anyone know what lower your years mean? It basically means to get a haircut in North Carolina. And I know uh, I can tell you a hundred terms like this, which I learned at the, at the feet of some amazing CEOs over the last you know, 20, 30 years working with them. Wow, that's really amazing. Um, I guess the key here is just be your interest in learning about other people and how they think so that you can get, a, get along with them and work with them effectively. And it, it, it's interesting. It wasn't even to get along with them. The, and, and this, I think, is a broader topic for, for engineers in particular and certainly a continuing is interest issue for me, which is part of this curiosity of getting to know people changes your own wisdom. 
you begin mm -hmm. to understand differences in a very, very profound way. You begin to understand that somebody means completely well, but they come from a different culture. You know, in, how many of you have, are from New York? Anyone from New York? We will feel okay. We will come. But you know, in the early days, people would say to me, we must get together when I got here, and I didn't understand it, and I would be waiting for the phone to ring, nobody called me. And you know, <laughs> and it made for a very lonely life. It wasn't that people, it's just the way people talk. It, you just have to understand it. Whereas in India, where I came from, this very innocent little background, when somebody said, we must get together, it's like, oh, show up whenever you want, and people would show up. You know, you never can anticipate how many people were gonna eat with you or drink with you. Not drink, really, eat or drink juice with you. But you know, you couldn't figure it out. But if you were, here, suddenly, you didn't understand what the wars were. You understood what, that people's boundaries were different, that you couldn't just show up when you wanted at people's homes. Like, what do you mean? You just showed up to see me? Where's my appointment? So you learn <laughs> lots of different things, and, and you understand it's not bad. It's just different. And it's OK. It's just, it's just that it certainly helps marriage, too, because you begin to understand that in every relationship, people are different. And then you just have to start thinking about people's perspectives from a different view. So, so I, I think that's a huge lesson to be curious about what makes people tick. That's great. That, that's a nice segue into maybe asking a little bit about your, your family life. You started a family while you were working at McKinsey. And how, can you share? Some yeah, I was the first woman partner. I may have been the first woman to have had a baby. In fact, ironically, 30 years later, or many years later, my daughter, who finished at Harvard, went to McKinsey. And I, when she said to me, should I go to McKinsey or somewhere else? I said, please go to McKinsey, because how can you even consider somewhere else? Because you know, this is like you were the first baby born to a McKinsey woman at that time. <laughs> yeah, I think there were a lot of reasons. You would barely see your husband. So you know, you, it's, it was very hard to have had a baby at that time. But it, it, was, it was tough. And when every woman, and, and there's some w many women in the room, and, and by the way, I want to say particular hello to the Society of Women Engineers. I think, I think it's fantastic that, that all of us women are, are really so strongly in the workplace. But it's really bloody hard. And you can't have it all the time, despite what everybody tells you. You can have some of it, some of, all of it some of the time. All of it some of the time, that's it. And you can't have all of it all of the time. And you keep thinking there's this ideal objective that you're going to have, and it doesn't happen. And then you're then screwed up in your head because you wish you'd done it. You've fallen short of some objective. So for women, it's just that much harder to kind of process that. Um, so it was really hard. I made some big mistakes when um, I was a mother. And I, but I was lucky that I got a chance to fix some of those mistakes soon enough with wisdom. But if I hadn't, I think I'd have paid some, a price. My daughter would have paid a price. My family would have paid a price. Where was your, what was your source of wisdom? Um, and this is, I would say the source of wisdom is really, I would say for me, if I were telling you what is the most important part of my life, it isn't really about anything about my business success. It's for me from uh, 20 years ago, um, at the height of my career, at truly, um, when I had a big deal that I had to sign, it was the height of, um, and I had to agree with the CEO. And normally, you know, I work with my business was that I work with big institutions one at a time. So I would go in, we would restructure the institution, and the CEO would normally require that I spend six months with them. And we did some spectacular transformations. I don't say we, but the, jointly we did it together with the CEO. So this was my, my business. And then we took equity stakes in the companies or we were involved in the company's long-term success. This was my business. It still is my business. This, I had this very big deal. It, this would have vaulted me into another level of, of success, uh, big money, big everything. Um, so I had pretty much agreed to do this deal. You know, It was a, a very prestigious one. I flew back from Europe. And I don't know what happened. I, couldn't sign the deal. I, I was supposed to get back to them in two days. And this was before the age of cell phones. And I'm telling you this for a reason, because I didn't, I just locked myself up in a room, and I was just crying. And I'm not a crying sort. You know, I'm a type A. I work like a maniac. If anybody asked me any time, I'd be looking at my watch and say, I'm stressed out. You know, I've got work to do. I've got meetings. You know, that's who I was. That's what I've been my whole life, you know, for, for 20 years. So this was. 
it, so I started to just, I didn't know why I was unraveling. And I wasn't, I didn't have any problems in my life. I had a husband who was a happy man. I had a child. I, had, I wasn't unhealthy. I didn't have a crisis of, I just had a crisis of spirit. And this was real. And so basically, I went through a complete evaluation to say, what, what am I, what do I want to do? What, what is important? What is success? Because I've been, from the age of, I finished school. I finished business school. When I was 20, I was one of the youngest to finish business school. And by the way, Harvard had set up a program in India. I'd been working nonstop. You know, I, I, I didn't want for anything. Then I just said, well, what, what happens if my life now ends? Or what? It wasn't that I had morbid thoughts of dying or anything, but what makes me really happy? Am I serving? Am I serving a purpose higher than myself? What? So these were questions which were very, very, very consuming for me. And I couldn't do the deal. And, I, and for the reason I said before the age of cell phones is my clients kept calling me and nobody could reach me because they could only reach the landline. They couldn't try my cell phone. And I wasn't answering any phone calls to anyone. But then I did something which I never thought I would do, which is I went back and said I couldn't do the deal. But that set me, and then, so then what was I going to do? Um, it set me on a whole journey of discovery. And it, I started to say I needed to rethink my life. Success and money was important, but what was success was a broader definition. You see, business, and I've no, I've nothing against business. I'm a business person. I still have, we still have a company. We do a lot of investing. We, we've a lot of, I'm very involved in the business space. But business is fundamentally unidimensional. You don't explore multiple dimensions of yourself. And to me, one of the big questions we all have to ask ourselves as human beings on this planet is not how do we become a better business person. It's like, how do we be become a better human being so that we are happy, that we can use all the gifts that we've been given, and to we serve the planet uh, in a better way? With, with all these we have, well, I mean, so what? I had a, my bank balance went up a little bit more. I got one more jacket of Chanel or, or something. It's all fine, you can have that too. But there's got to be a broader purpose. And I would say that was my wisdom, Sujay, because it literally changed my, the prism with which I viewed my entire existence. Now, does that mean I went into lotus eating after that and saying, <laughs> not at all, I'm, I would say, I'm much, much busier than I ever was um, you know, 20 years ago. Much busier, my, my days are. But everything is very conscious. Um, it's conscious actions as opposed to something somebody laid out for me or I laid out for myself in some sleepy, f in a sleepwalking fashion. Mm -hmm. So essentially you had an epiphany. Completely. And it only took two days. It didn't take two days. The two days was the entire crisis point, but it took me almost a year or two of mm. redefining it. And I would say I'm still redefining it. I'm still working on this journey. And that's how I went into saying, what are the happiest parts of my life? And, that's, and in fact, that's when I got into music, which I realized music was a big part of it. And I said, I want to do something that also gives me an extraordinary amount of happiness. That's when I went into serving. That's how I got engaged with NYU. I said, I can't simply be um, you know, doing things for myself or just doing more in the business world. So I said, let me go and give my time. And I became an executive in residence at the business school. And this is in 2000, early 2000. And I started to just, just serve, do, did nothing. No, I didn't ask, it was not a paid position. I just lived with the faculty. The dean just invited me in and I had wow. so much business experience. And so what was supposed to be two days a week ended up being three days, two hours a week ended up being three days a week. I pretty much lived there, taught classes, and did my business. So I did that for many years before I got more deeply engaged at NYU. So I did that when nobody knew who I was other than the faculty at the business school. So that's when, then, and the, the advantage it gave me though is that when, when the faculty say, well, you business people don't understand faculty. I had my moments of shock in the first few days of being there, but then I spent several years living, you know, working with them and, and thinking about research, doing a lot of stuff while I was doing my, my business hmm. work. So during that time, how did you become a leader in, in, mu in music as well? So this is part of things. what happened. A lot of, wh when, I, when I started to then go in, I realized I was actually quite good at it. I didn't go in to perform. I didn't go in because I wanted to go and become a big artist or anything like that. I did music because it made me happy. And because I was excellence focused, I decided that I wanted to just find the great masters to teach me. 
And then I went to classes. And this is a, an important topic for um, which, again, my own lesson in this. Nothing comes out of life by just um, dabbling at it. You know, you, you really have to work at it. And, and, and at least for me, this was what it was in music. And here I was, most of these masters took on students when they were three. And I was like 40 years old or something, you know, trying to learn music, 45. And my masters are like, what? You want to learn music? Come back in your next lifetime, you know? <laughs> it's like, no one cares, you know, pretty much. And I was a music beggar, you know? And, and just to, to let you know, you know, I, I was pretty successful. I had a housekeeper who washed all the clothes and stuff like that. I would stand outside this master's house because I, I wanted him to teach me so badly. And, and I, I kid you not, it's a true story. And then I would be waiting, and he wouldn't teach me, and he might teach me, may not teach me. We don't know exactly what time. So I'd be washing his, his clothes. I'd be washing his vessels. I mean, I did all these jobs because I was so desperate to learn. And so this is truly immersion. And the other story I'll tell you, which is about women and balance, I was a mother. You know, my daughter is just 31 now. So she was still not exactly old. And when I started on this music journey, you know, Thank God, you know, she woke up late in the morning when she was little. She woke up at 10.30 because she was a, she could not, she was not an early riser. Really, it's a, it's, it's a privilege that that happened. So I would leave at 4.30 in the morning, 4, 4 in the morning, 4.30, because my class, I, I begged this world-class musician to teach me at Wesleyan University. At 6.30 in the morning, he'd start my classes. 6.30 to 8.30, he would teach me every Saturday and every Sunday. So I'd go there from 6.30 to 8.30, drive back to us, drive there to us, drive back to us, and be literally, I would mark the speeding cameras so that I could be back there at 10.30, just in time for my daughter to wake up. And then I was the perfect mom, you know, trying to balance that. But I did this for many years. I did, this is what it took for me, um, this kind of intensity to balance, to be, uh, to balance these multiple roles. And I think now, now with the more equal society, men I think are doing more of that. But in my time, you know, it was all the burden of women. Though I must say my husband was a Renaissance man and that he did play an extraordinarily good role in, in taking care of my daughter. But she needed a mother. Wonderful. Um, so it's interesting. Today we are more and more people not talking only about STEM, but STEAM. This is where we integrate arts into science, technology, engineering, math. Um, can you talk about how the arts and humanities can maybe help us here uh, train better future engineering leaders um, and scientists? You know, the, it's interesting. It's, it almost seems an anomaly to talk of STEM anymore because it's technology, the way we understood technology, the w world of technology that we knew 30 years ago simply is not the world that exists today. So many new, new spaces have come in, you know, sort of cross-disciplinary areas that didn't exist before have all emerged. I mean, we, we were just talking, Dan and I were just talking, I mean, bioengineering. Who had heard of computational biology or bioengineering 20 years ago? Who had been speaking about deep learning and AI, you know, 20 years ago? I mean, artificial intelligence was just out there as a topic. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have the cloud. We didn't have so many things happening. So there's so much in terms of uh, interdisciplinary work that's happening. Of course, the schools are, are certainly investing at Berkeley's at the forefront of, of a lot of this. And, but then you start to say, well, you need to have a lot of critical thinking. Now, there's one element of the arts, which is, yeah, you know, there's all the research that comes out which says, you know, if you play flute music, the neural networks of babies change and then they all become happier people. And all of that's probably true. So when I think of integrating the arts, it's not that everybody needs to sing and dance and be merry, and that will make STEM better. So I'm sure some of that's true as well. You know, we can all be happier human beings. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. But I think there's a, there's a broader question about, you s introduced this session saying engineering to solve society's problems. But then you say, if you don't really have a very good handle on society's problems, in, in the most profound way of thinking about society, how do you really apply your s skills to society's problems? And society's problems aren't engineering problems. Society's problems are very multidisciplinary problems. They're social problems, 
okay, economics, I think, actually falls into the STEM category. So leave economics out. There are arts problems. I mean, we were just, you know, and, and one of the teams at the engineering school developed a way to, because when, when autistic children go into uh, dental, uh, into dental facilities, they're very, very scared. So you need to bring in a lot of the design thinking, a lot of the creative thinking, the colors, the, the stimulants, and all of that to help, uh, to help that. So there's so much that needs to come together. So you need the design, you need the, the visual arts impact, you need the, the you know, and, and we're working, and I'm sure you are as well, which is we're working with so many schools, so many uh, local communities with cerebral palsy, with autism, with stroke victims using music and movement and dance and, and measurement of how that affects the, the improvement. So it's so pervasive in the applications of all of what's happening in, in STEM. So to not have an understanding of that seems almost like, like losing an entire, big, um, an entire big bucket of what this is all supposed to be used for. I was in London um, last week with, with the engineering societies, the three engineering societies, the National Academy, the Royal Academy, and the Peking Academy on the Grand Challenges, which is the 17 engineering Grand Challenges. And you know, now every one of the students is now thinking about how do we bring together these different skills, these different pigeons and po pigeonholes and pockets that have happened in various disciplines together for, for solving individual problems. And all the problems are not engineering problems. They are <laughs> artistic problems. They are design problems. They are visual problems. So I think it's, so that's kind of one area. I think the other area, I want to just use my own example. Reading and thinking, and there's a whole logic behind a liberal arts education. Not that we suddenly have to disperse with all the engineering and replace everybody with, with liberal arts education. That's not at all what I'm arguing for. But I think there are some foundational Courses. I mean, I keep thinking to myself, should everybody be required to do a great books kind of thought process? Because, you know, there's this beautiful poem, right? Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. So there's people that have gone the road before us, perhaps not in all the technological nuances that we're dealing with, but, but there are historical um, sort of, um, you know, precedents to what's happening around the world. So in my vision, I think of this as boundaryless um, engineering in, in some way, and in terms of the way we have to think about this. So it's no longer breaking boundaries, but Bound seeking, unbounded. New, <laughs> seeking unbounded. new horizons. That's great. So one last thing we haven't touched upon yet in our conversation is um, your work as a philanthropist. Well, I guess a little bit starting with your volunteer work for NYU. But um, you've really helped to support many um, worthy causes. So not only the New, York, New York's Lincoln Center, the Berkeley College of Music, that's not this Berkeley, it's spelled differently, um, University of Pennsylvania, as well as NYU, um, where you and your husband recently provided a significant gift to name the College of Engineering at NYU. It's called the Tandon School. So what is it about engineering that inspires you? You know, technology is in every part of society. We cannot, I mean, I really believe that education is critical, so education is the window. I mean, so I'm, I'm going to leave that aside for the moment because I'm, I'm going to take that as a sort of given, you know. But with, te with engineering, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I didn't even, uh, didn't even understand what it is, what, you know, because I came from the business world, I was an artist, you know, I, whatever. I, d I don't ever think of myself as an engineer in any way. But the more you begin to understand what's happening, it is, it is changing how business works. I mean, now in the business school, we're talking about fintech. We're talking about, you know, all cyber, bitcoins, everything. I mean, when we did business 40 years ago, the, the issues were different than what's happening now. In arts, I mean, I've been, I'm in the arts world. The entire space of music, technology, Spotify, streaming, all of that's changing. Visual arts is changing. I mean, we're doing a lot of work with the museums in New York. So much is happening in terms of preservation, being able to use. You don't even need to go into a museum anymore. You can pretty much sit with your VR and AR glasses, and you can, you can experience everything. So technology is not 
anymore a sort of a bystander to what's happening in society. So then we have a generation in America, which is shocking in a way to a person who has not grown up here. In India and in some parts of Europe, the smartest kids went to technical schools, to engineering schools and so on. This is kind of the way the tradition was. In America, while there's a strong liberal arts orientation, the smartest kids went to the great liberal arts schools. So part of the overhang, and, and it's kind of why we were so excited and enthused and uh, when my friend John invited us to participate in the engineering school, we were such believers that once you can get these students, get great students in, build a excellence without to sacrificing elitism too much, you know, where, where, mm -hmm. with sacrificing elitism, the opposite of it actually, that you could, and then make sure that they are economically employable, which is also an important thing when students graduate with a lot of debt. You, you really are changing the, the sort of the, the narrative in society to some degree. So I think, to me, this is one of the greatest investments all of us can make in, in the engineering school. If engineering schools can redefine their own thought process, I don't think we should be working anymore in pigeonholes and pockets because I think that that's, that's a disservice to society. Engineering schools, if many of the motto lines read that you know, in service of society. No other school health to some degree, but no other school reads that with that motto. And that is an extraordinary thing. And if we, if we can really make that the beacon of how schools, not one school, but all the schools operate and really work towards uh, moving there, it's an extraordinary investment. There's no better investment. Wonderful. At this point, thanks so much, uh, Chandrika. At this point, I think I'd like to give our students a chance to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. And um, I'll ask them to, when you ask your question, please stand up and I say your name, uh, maybe say what year you are and what major. In the back, on the back wall. Hello. Hi, my name is Sydney. Um, so I'm a third year mechanical engineer. And one of the questions I had was, you mentioned uh, how you were going through your career and you had a lot of difficulties. But did you have a role model as, to like, help you look up to as you were navigating through your career? You know, this, this question about mentors and role models is a really important one. And uh, there are, in my, in my career, there were my, a couple of my professors who when I got to business school, who basically said to me, you can, you know, we'll open whatever you need to open. But they were, they were in India, so there's not a lot they could open at that time. But it doesn't matter, the fact that you had this confidence that they would be the wind behind your back. But there's a broader point about role models, and, and I'm going to answer it in two ways, which may not be um, completely what you want. You know, when you... When you take a longer view of helping people, whether it's clients or whether it's um, people that you work with in, in any way, shape, or form, when you go the extra mile, things, karma really works in an extraordinary way. And so the mentors and role models come back to help you in, in, in very extraordinary ways. And I'm going to tell you a story, and this is a true story, and this is from a client. It wasn't quite a role model. It was just a situation where I helped a client, you know, canceled a flight that I needed to go to and helped this client work for, for 48 hours straight to get this client. We, we restructured a new restructuring plan for this company that was failing. Fast forward 15 years later. I mean, I didn't think much about it. I, you know, it cost me $1,000 at that time in a plane ticket, which I could ill afford. And I, but that was the cost of it. I didn't have to do it, but I did it because I wanted to. 15 or 12 years later, when I set up my company, and I was like be with a begging bowl going around trying to drum up business, you know, and there was nobody out there saying, ah, oh, you opened your doors, come on over. No one was interested in me. Out of the blue, the CEO of one of these failing institutions, the chairman of <coughs> Atlantic Bank, found my number, called me up, and he said, oh, you know, I'd like you to come and pitch to me. And my company was literally, I was down to my last dollar at that time. And it was such a welcome thing. And you know how he'd heard about me? Because there's no reason he, he should have heard about me. He heard about me from this client I'd helped 12 years ago. He had interviewed him for vice chairman of his new company. And this guy said, if you're ever going to restructure anyone, you need to get Chandrika to come and help you. So you know, role models and mentors come in 
different shapes and forms. So I would say expand your definition of thinking about it. It isn't just that one or two people are going to do some great things for you. People do it. You just have to keep doing the right thing, and somehow the universe has a way of taking care of it. Hi, I'm Samyukta. I'm a freshman engineering physics major. So my question is, a lot of us engineers kind of, uh, we um, end up going into very specific topics of research or very uh, maybe a very small portion of a bigger issue. So um, as a philanthropist and somebody who's uh, in the business world, how would you suggest that you keep perspective um, even as you go delve into you know one particular topic? Um, because it's very easy to lose uh, track of the uh, larger picture when you work at that. I sort of think of this, and, and a lot more, and I don't know the Berkeley curriculum, and, and your dean can talk more about this, but basically it's like a T-shaped, or it's not even a T-shaped, or whatever, a pie-shaped, um, kind of thing where you, because you can't escape the depth that you need to get into with the engineering, because otherwise you know, you'd just be doing everything at one inch deep kind of th uh, uh, curriculum. But there's got to be whatever foundational courses which kind of get you into thinking about the world, not just when you enter and not just when you finish, but periodically, because that's the only way you will get reconnected. The world is changing so fast. And I don't think some of these solutions, whether they are uh, whether it's how do we solve the water issue or how do we figure out about renewable energy is not something that, you know, there's so many strides being made every, every week, every month, and so you just need to be back. You need to dip down but also get back up. And so whether it's taking courses in other schools or having curricular opportunities within your own school, I, I strongly think, and by the way, I would also add part of this bound, boundaryless notion is to actually have to break down global boundaries, because everything is not invented here. If you look at it, in fact, I was with a group of venture capitalists just last week, and one of the things many of them are doing is they kind of take engineering solutions and they try them out <coughs> in countries which are like third world countries, you know, where, and then they take them, see if there's a proof of concept, and then they bring them back here for commercial success. So, you know, the incubator for the neonatal incubator, which is battery park, wasn't invented here. It was invented in some place in India or China. And the same thing with the $10 washing machine. So I think some of this, getting that perspective, breaking the boundaries, both in terms of disciplines as well as the global barriers, is a really critical thing to do. And, and you owe it to yourself to do that. Yeah. And I just to augment on that, I think it helps to keep in mind uh, as you're working on your own research project, if you're if you're successful, what difference, you know, what impact will it make in the world? And that'll help you to keep an eye in the background, at least to keep in mind the, the the whole reason why you're doing that research, and you know, giving your life um, a higher purpose. That's kind of one yeah. of the keys to happiness, and well-being, in as we know it. More questions. Uh, Felix, third year CS major. Uh, so the two, so the two days where you um, started like questioning, like what did you really want? So why do you think it happened then and not earlier? And also, what advice do you have for people who uh, feel similarly? Uh, it's a it's a really good question. I mean, I I sort of. Initially, I was asking myself, I, why didn't it happen earlier? And then I said to myself, thank God it didn't happen later. <laughs> because it changed my de definition of happiness. I mean, um, because of what, what I now can genuinely say to you is if I died today, I, I would have done exactly what I want to do. I have no regrets, which is a very profound thing to be able to say about your life. And, and I now think about that very consciously. And the advice I would give is, it's the same, it's a variation of the same question that you asked me about how do you go from this very deep, because especially engineering and especially um, a highly technical science demands excellence at a very deep level. I mean, you're not going to get that by sort of fluttering about on the surface. You have to be very, very intense. But then 
whatever that intensity is, whether you're exploring a nanotechnology of something, you have to, you owe it yourself to take a day or two or whatever. The things that helped me, which, and, and you know, might or might not be, might be in Berkeley, it's not as taboo as a subject, is some of the things that helped me were like intense meditation and really sort of stepping beyond the boundaries of every day and beginning to understand, you know, or just, just quieting this grand central terminal that is your mind, to start to just listen to exactly who you are and what you want to do. I mean, goodness <coughs> me, the smarter you are, the more active you are, the more successful you are, the, the greater the number of uh, s trains that keep crisscrossing in your mind. And it's very hard to take a pause when that's happening. So how do you pause? So, you know, it's not, and you, and you know, one can always make the case, oh, it's great to say that when you're successful, if you have money and so on. When you don't have money is the time you need to do it more, because that's when you need to step out of it to otherwise you're, 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 you're just unhappy. I mean, what's the point if you're stressed out? I mean, how, you know, and then, then you have all of the other issues coming up with it. If it's stressful now, it's just gonna get worse. And I don't mean it in a negative way. It's just life, life's like that. You have kids, you have families, you have challenges, your jobs, people treat you well, people don't treat you well. You leave the cocoon of your, of your beautiful colleges. All right. Does yeah. that help? <laughs> well, no, I, I don't mean to be a, a sort of a putting a damper here. It's actually an exciting story. If you can be busy and have a, a, a genuine smile, not that anyone else needs to see whether it's a fake smile or not, but you get up and feel amazing and you're making your corner of the planet better, you can say you're leading a good life. And that's really what I would like all of you to aspire for yourself. And find out what resources you need to get you there. Because the world will help, especially in a place like Berkeley, this world-class school with, with this amazing leader that you have. I mean, the, the, everyone wants, to, wants you to succeed. And not just, I mean, I know, Right here, there's another Steve Jobs, there's another Aristotle, there's another Edison. All of you are sitting here, and salutations to all of you. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, let's thank Chandrika for sharing her words of wisdom and giving us inspiration. Thank you so much. So, our students would like to express, uh, give you a memento to express our appreciation. <laughs> Yes. It's a Berkeley Engineering jacket. <laughs> Keep you warm. Which I should wear with pride. Thank so you. I'd like to thank you once again, uh, the Society for Women Engineers, once again, for co hosting thank you, today's event. <laughs> and, and to thank you all for coming. And um, go Bears. What else can I say? <laughs> all right. All right.